I'm sure you've had it happen to you in the doctor's office. You know, you have a pain and the doctor begins to place his or her hand like in different places, you know, on your body. And then they find the, oh yeah, the source of pain is like, ah, you know, oh, your jaw hurts, ah, you know. Have you ever had that experience before? I, I don't wanna get too technical, but yeah, we all have had that experience. And the doctor, they have that ability to place their hand right uh, in those areas that are causing us problems. It's kind of a very telling thing when you go to the doctor. Well, during this series, I've been trying by the Holy Spirit of God to, to put the Lord's hands, the great physician's hands on that area that ah causes uh, some pain and ooh, it's kind of sensitive. And we've been, we've been talking about stuff, right? Materialism. We've been talking about cash because money matters to me and Money matters to you. Stuff matters to me and stuff matters to you. Stuff matters to God. Yes, God is the God of the intangible. We make a faith decision. We trust him. He's also a God of the tangible. He created us. He made us. Matter matters. So to say, oh, God doesn't care about stuff. God cares about stuff. And, and, and we've been discovering around here whether we have a strong opinion about it or not, God owns all the stuff. Number two, God has given us all the stuff. So number one, God owns all the stuff. Number two, God has given us all the stuff. And number three, we manage the stuff. Again, it doesn't matter what I feel or what, or what my opinion might be. It doesn't matter what a focus group says, or, or, or all of that. It's just what God says. So I thought about our stuff, and I thought about a guy in the Bible. In fact, he was a kid in the Bible. I call him the kindergarten king. His name was Joash. Joash actually built a box. I don't know if he built it with Legos or what, but as a king, as a kindergarten king, he had a box built, and this box really changed the course of the way people viewed stuff. Isn't that crazy? What a name, Joash. Difficult name number one. Now, difficult name number two in this story was Joash's uncle. His name was Jehoiada. Jehoiada. Say it with me. Jehoiada, I love that name. Wouldn't that be a great name? That'd be a really good name for, for uh, like if you're expecting and you're having a son, Jehoiada. I'm serious. This guy was an amazing man. The Bible says in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 23, let me give you the cliff notes, that Jehoiada, now Jehoiada was a priest, when I say the word priest, don't think about like this guy, you know, with the clerical collar, with the big cross, who's kind of, you know, very formal and, and sort of soft. No, no, no. Jehoiada was a special forces guy. He was a guy who had to open up a can on some people. He was a guy who did some covert and overt operations to really change the course of leadership in Judah. Interesting guy. So he was a priest. This would be a pretty good movie, wouldn't it? But, but also, he was like a special forces guy. He was, let me say it again, the uncle to Joash. So let's call Jehoiada just Uncle Jay, okay? Uncle Jay, it's easier. So we got Uncle Jay and Joash. Am I going too fast? Joash is the kindergarten king. You're like, how did that happen? Here's how it happened. You know King David. I'm going back several thousand years, thousands of years. You know Solomon, David's son. Solomon built the temple, a house of worship, which was absolutely amazing. 
I believe that the house of God, biblically speaking, should be a house of excellence. I believe the church should be the best looking building in the community or in the city. I'm not saying opulent, I'm saying with excellence because everything we do reflects the nature and the character of God. So Solomon built it, it was like, wow, incredible. Well, due to just some rebelliousness and craziness, the whole thing um, literally went to hell in a handbasket. Uncle Jay, this priest stood and he saw that the house of God was in disrepair. He's like, man, it's terrible. Technology's out of date, holes in the carpet, parking lot has potholes everywhere. It's not even landscape right. We need to go to multi-site, he said. Uncle Jay said, let's buy this building, do that. Yet nothing was happening. So Joash, this kindergarten kid became the king of Judah. And Uncle Jay was the one who got him in that position. He's the one that made him. Well, Joash's grandmother was killing everybody right and left. She was a serial killer. She tried to kill her grandson, Joash. But Uncle Jay, man, he was too smart. He was too sly. He wasn't having any of that. So Uncle Jay ended up taking her out is this crazy? I mean, this is nuts. So Joash, as a kindergarten kid, takes the throne. His mentor is Uncle Jay. Uncle Jay was a great guy. And the Bible says that Uncle Jay said before God, the people, the priests, the pastors and all that, and the king, God, will follow you. We're making a covenant with you. That's what Uncle Jay said. So, Joash takes the reins. And I love what the Bible says about him. Let us look at 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 1. Joash, the Bible says, was seven years old when he became king. And he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. 40 years. And then the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 2, Joash did... What was what? He did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Uncle Jay, the priest. I mean, he's a king, a kid. You're like, oh man, Ed, I'm seven years old. Ed, I'm 13. Ed, I'm 17. Ed, I'm 18 or whatever. What I do doesn't matter. Are you kidding me? I would say some of the best Christians at fellowship are children, no doubt. Their heart for God, their heart for the house, their heart for his word, their heart for people. And if you ever go to our children's ministry and look around, there's nothing like it. It is truly amazing. And I'm so excited that God doesn't say, well, you're, you're too young. I'm so excited that God doesn't say, well, you're in kindergarten. I'm so excited that God uses young people. Look how we use Joash. This guy was killing it, man, crushing it as a kindergarten king. I love how Uncle Jay mentored him. Yeah, we're gonna find out, if you keep on reading, this is kind of bad news, but I'll go back to the good news. After Uncle Jay died, when he died, Joash went off the rails. I mean, he went off the reservation, and it shows you the importance, does it not, of the right people in your life. You can have the right people around you for 40 years, and then you get older, maybe in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you're like, well, I can just do what I wanna do now. Well, I can listen to this group or that group. And that's what happened to Joash. So sadly, he went kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs after Uncle Jay died. So that shows you the importance of living the life and having the right people around you because when they move, when they pass away, when they're transferred or whatever, you've got to have that discernment 
and to surround yourself with the right they. That'd be a good book, wouldn't it? The right they. So that's the story. So little Joe Ash, Mr. Lego guy, is sitting on the throne. He's looking around. He's playing video games now and then. Uncle Jay is his mentor. And, and, and Joe Ash is, is, is really having the time of his life. So he looks around and he goes, man, something's not right. Something's not right. God's house is not right. It, it needs to be changed. It needs to be brought up to speed. So he begins to lead, you know, fueled by Uncle Jay, this rebuilding of the temple. But did you, did you hear what I read? You hear what I read in that, in that second verse? Did you hear what I read? I hope you didn't miss this. Verse two, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada, Uncle Jay, the priest. Do right in the sight of God. So what is right in the sight of God is right in the past. What's right in the sight of God is right in the present. And what's right in the sight of God will be right in the future. I mean, do you do what's right in the sight of God? Let me talk to the young people here. Let me talk to the parents here. Let me talk to the grandparents here. Are you doing what's right in the sight of God? Because if I please God, it doesn't matter who I displease. If I displease God, it doesn't matter who I please. Yet we're caught in this web of clicks and likes and followers and friends and, and, and opinions and focus groups and trends and polls. We're playing for an audience of one. At the end of the day, I need to do right in the sight of God. Here's where how I've messed up and wasted a lot of time. I've said to myself, well, okay, I wanna, I wanna follow you, God. You know, I wanna do what's right on your side, but also I'm gonna prove to her. I mean, one day when I make that amount of money or have, or have that much acclaim or that many followers, she will go, wow, I guess I was wrong about you. Or I'll prove to him, maybe a family member, hey, I did have the talent. I can do it. And you get to that certain point, wow, I will feel it then. But here's what happens. Normally when you get to that point, those people don't even care. Also, a lot of them move. Some of them even die. I think we think that people think about us all the time. They don't think about us all the time. Sometimes I think, well, I guess people are thinking about me. No, they're not. They're not thinking about you either. They're not. So God makes it simple. Joash did what was right in the sight of God, no matter how popular or unpopular it was. What I love about this kid king was that he and Uncle Jay were the only ones that really saw, okay, we have got to finance this rebuilding and the repair work of the temple. I mean, they were the only ones. And throughout the Bible, when, when, when God has a plan, he always chooses a man or a woman every time. It's not a committee. Let me say it again. It's not a committee. I'll say it a third time. It's not a committee. A giraffe is a horse put together by a committee. <laughs> Does that make sense? Did I say it right? A giraffe, think about that, is a horse put together by a committee. The reason I just paused is because between services I had a meeting and, 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 and the guy goes, what did you mean by that? And I said it again, and this guy's an attorney, no wonder. And again, I said, you do have your law degree, right? He goes, yes. I had to say it three times finally. He goes, oh, I got it now. <laughs> That's why I was a little worried. 
I had to get that line right. Think about that. That's a hard line. A giraffe is a horse put together by a committee. Why did I say that? Well, because Joe Ash, I got to blow my nose again. Joe Ash made a mistake. He put together a committee. And committees, thank you, committees don't work. I think you know that. Death by committee. And he had to go through the planning and zoning committee of Judah and the city council of Judah. And, and isn't it interesting? I mean, no disrespect to city councils and planning and zoning committees, but those are little people with little vision trying to hammer big people with big vision. And we have so many rules and regulations and attorneys and crap out there. It's hard to do anything. I'm talking to the leaders here. I'm talking to the entrepreneurs here. I'm talking to the pastors here. I mean, just to do what we do at Fellowship Church, just to buy this building in Frisco, just to have multi-sites, all of the regulations and all of the money we have to pay for this study and that study and will it hurt the, the, the mating of the snail darter in this pond that you have to build for half a million dollars just to build this facility. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I'm not hating on attorneys. I love lawyers. I love people who are in planning and zoning. I'm not saying that. I love people who are, you know, part of city councils. It's just what we've been done. So I'm gonna get you to hold this microphone, Dr. Cross, because I gotta blow my nose. I, I put uh, makeup on. I have to. I don't wear makeup every day. <laughs> don't start that rumor. But I put makeup because the lights and stuff, and it does look better when I have makeup on. I don't put on a lot. And for some reason, I don't know why, when I put this makeup on, my nose invariably runs. I'm allergic to it. I don't know what it is, so I gotta blow my nose. And as I've told you before, my wife blows her nose like I've counted. She averages 20 times a day. I've never seen, she's not here so I can say it. I've never seen anybody blow their nose as much as Lisa does in my life. We have tissue everywhere. I blow my nose like one time a day. Today it'll be two. I'll blow it in the first service because the nose started running. I'll blow it here. I'm done after that. I don't blow my nose all the time. So let me, let me blow my nose. I'm not gonna gross anybody out. And I'll have Dr. Cross. Dr. Cross right here, this is sad. He's the only guy I know that carries around a snot rag with him. He carries around what my papa used to carry around back in the 50s, you know, one of those handkerchiefs. Are you kidding me? But maybe after this nose run, maybe I see, look, he has it right there. This is embarrassing, stand up. That is the worst. That is the, he's from the country. Turn around, show him that. Look, it, it keeps it right there. Amen. Wow. I got to pull my snot rag out. I've got one handy. Oh my gosh. It's embarrassing. That's like, no, you know, it's not. You know, I might just use it. Have you used that today already? Your snot rag? Oh, I'm not going to use it. Okay. Hope. Thank you. Some people, when they blow their nose, not to be too gross, you know, they, they make these sounds like that, like an elephant. I have one friend and blows his nose. And when he blows it, boom, does it around. I'm like, oh my gosh. I might try it. Those things are overrated. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? So, we're having fun, aren't we? We're just family. We are. We're just family. Aren't we, Laurie? We're family. Yes, that's my, that's my daughter. Thank you. I need, did you say you, you love me? I need to hear that. Hey, I can live off a compliment for six months. Sometimes people say, Ed, I know you hear this all the time. I go, no, I don't. Tell me. They tell me that. Like people all the time are going, oh, I love you. You're great. I enjoy it. No, I don't hear it. Tell me. <laughs> we love compliments, don't you? Everybody does. Just like Joe Ash. I mean, he and, he, and, he and Uncle Jay, man, they would compliment each other, I guarantee it, all the time. So, so Joe Ash puts together a committee. The committee drags its feet. And, and this kid king, like, gets up in the grill of this committee. You might be thinking, well, okay, explain it, all right? Look at uh, 2 Chronicles 24, 
verses four through five. Now it came about after this that Joash, who was the only one who saw the situation, he and Uncle Jay, decided, I love this, to restore the house of the Lord. So he gathered the priests and Levites, blah, 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 together, and he wanted it done. I like it what, because it says, um, and they collected money from all of Israel to repair the house of your God annually. Say it with me, annually. So we right now are in a capital campaign called Intense to hopefully raise between 28 to $40 million over and above our regular giving to continue to build the house of God because the house of God is his house. I mean, it is. I understand that we're the body of Christ. You show me though someone who says, I have a heart for God and I'll show you somebody that has a heart for his house. It's impossible to have a heart for God and not to have a heart for his house. It's impossible. Well, <laughs> here's, here's death by committee. But the Levites, and the Levites, those are, those are people that led in worship, in construction, in maintenance, in leadership in the house of God. It says, but the Levites, the last part of verse five, did not act quickly. So not only were they disregarding the king's orders and Uncle Jay's orders, they were disregarding God's orders. So, so Joash was like, now. Uncle Jay was like, now. Build it. Bring the money in. Now. I'm tired of these committees. I'm tired of the planning and zoning. I'm tired of the city council. I'm tired of the regulation. Now, now, that's why we're doing this now. We only have a brief window of opportunity as a church. Three or four times in the history of our church have we had an opportunity like this. Time is now. But we can always come up with reasons not to do this. Wow, Fellowship Church is one of the largest churches around. Fellowship Church is doing this and doing that. Man, have you heard about the economy? Well, let me quote Hank Williams Jr. The interest is up and the stock market's down. You only get mugged if you go downtown. I live back in the woods, you see. My woman and the kids and the dogs and me. I got a shotgun, a rifle, and a four-wheel drive, and country folk can survive. I mean, that's depressing, isn't it? How depressing is that song? I could talk all day and night about all the interest rate. Oh, I'm not sure in this crazy economy. Oh, we've got to, to, to go through so many regulations and specifications, and we've got to do this and do that. Hey, the time is now. The time is now. All the buildings you see have been constructed because of what Joash did and was challenging the people to do. These buildings were constructed because we said, now's the time. Now's the time. I look back, our church kicked off in 1990. We bought this land out here. They thought we were crazy McCrays, 159.2 acres. We bought it from the Resolution Trust Corporation for $2.5 million. We didn't have a dime of it. We were able to raise enough to put down a down payment and we owed $1.875 million on all of this acreage. Nothing was out here. We were 13 miles away from the place we were meeting, an old high school in Irving, Texas and a dilapidated theater in Irving, Texas. We were a church on the move, man. People were like, what are you guys doing, building a golf course? 159.2 acres, what? A year later, we sold 22 of the 159.2 for exactly what we owed, $1.875 million. 
Woo! Yeah. That was when the economy was so low, the government, the government, was selling land. We bought this land from the government, the Resolution Trust Corporation. But we had a problem. We didn't have a building. We got the land, people clap, yeah! woo -hoo -hoo! No building. The economy was terrible again. It was in the tank. So, what did we do? We did what Joash is gonna command the people to do. We got together as a church and we gave over and above our regular giving to make this thing happen. So every building you see at Fellowship Church was given as an offering over and above our regular giving. You know, sometimes people say drive by. You know, when I say drive-by, that has a negative connotation, does it not? You think about shooting. You think about gangs. You think about drugs. Drive-by. Hear about these cars just driving by and gunning down people. Well, let's baptize drive-by. What if drive-by could be good? Because in my view, a drive-by is good. Every time Lisa and I drive by this facility, we say, you know what? We played a massive role financially in making this happen. So every time we just have a drive by or a drive up, I'm like, yay God. Do you have that? Maybe you don't have that. Well, you can have that where we're going. Well, Joe Ash, you know, puts together this committee. The committee doesn't work. And then, I mean, he starts getting tough. So, so, so then he tells Uncle Jay, Uncle Jay, why? Dude, why, Uncle Jay? Why are people dragging their feet? Why all of this rigmarole? Why all of the regulations? So then, 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 so the king summoned Uncle Jay, look at verse six, the chief priest and said, why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from Jerusalem the levy, that's simply the tithe that God gave Moses to give to the people in the wilderness, fixed by Moses, the servant of the Lord, on the congregation of Israel for the tent of the testimony. I like that, the tent of the testimony. That's the tabernacle, the temple, you could call this church the tent of the testimony, the testimony of changed lives. Again, my friend, heart for God, heart for the house. Do you have a heart for the house? Oh yeah, I do. Well, that's intangible. How about tangibly? Oh, I, I trust you, Lord, for my eternity. Do you really trust God? Let me, let, me, let me look at your financial statement. Really? If you're not doing the minimum worship requirement, I'm just telling you straight up. If you're not bringing the first 10%, you don't have a heart for the house. And you know what? And this is gonna sound crazy, but I can give you some biblical background for this. I wonder if you're a true believer. I really, really do. Just, just, you look at the Bible, look at materials, look at stuff, look at money. If you're not bringing the minimum requirement in, I've got to go, eh, I, you might be, I mean, I'm not God. I'm just, I would just question that. Because when your heart has been changed by God, there is not enough that you can bring to him. And see, this is where the rubber meets the road. This separates the tire kickers from the buyers, the men from the women, the boys from the girls. It, it, this is the deal right here. That's why whenever I preach on money, we don't have a lot of people showing up. Normally we're in the balcony and all that. I understand. And sadly, people bolt when I talk about money and what they don't realize is they're bolting from the blessings of God. I'll never forget a family a while back 
during one of these uh, series, invited Lisa and I over for dinner. And they'd done really well financially. We had this nice Italian meal. And I thought, okay, we've never been over to their house before. Beautiful house, you know. During the middle of the meal, this woman looked at me and she goes, you know, Ed, I really don't like uh, what you've been talking about lately, about tithing. I just, I just don't like the way you've been talking about it. Hmm, I thought. It's pretty, it's pretty direct, isn't it? Well, what was her problem? Her problem, like her husband's problem, was the great physician Jesus was just examining them and, ah, oh, touch the liver. I mean, the giver, they, they had and have a disease called the cirrhosis of the giver <laughs> because they've been drinking too many martinis of materialism and they didn't like it. See, their problem is not with me. The problem is with God. And thankfully, they left the church. <laughs> oh, I love it when certain people leave churches. Don't, don't, don't think I don't. We've grown as much through subtraction as addition. And one of the great things about a series like this is it separates the wheat from the tares. So yeah, this series is for the core but the core is going to give more, and because we give more, we're going to reach more. So this is a good thing. So Joe Ash, man, he tightens the screws, and then he goes, okay, let's get this thing going. Let's get on with it. That's what he says. So then he begins to, to go, okay, let's build a box, and let's take this box and put it in a prominent place. Just, just read the rest of the story. And this is called the chest of Joash. That's what it's called. But I like to call it Uncle Jay's chest because Uncle Jay was really the brains behind the operation. I understand that it's called Joash and he's gotten all the clicks and the likes and the followers. But in reality, I've got to say it's Uncle Jay's chest. So they took this chest and they put it in a prominent place. And it says, everybody, I mean, this is the first intense campaign. One, one, one of the first. Everybody, everywhere, engaging in eternity. So everybody, the Bible says, brought their money. Well, let me, let me read it. Let me read it. It says, 2 Chronicles 24, let's go to verse 10. All the officers and all the people rejoiced. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, we're going to the electric chair. No, it wasn't that. And they brought, you don't give it, see? They brought, that's management. They brought, that's not ownership, in their levies, tithes, offerings, and dropped them, ka into the chest. Ka-chink, ka -chink. say it with me. ka -chink. chink, chink, chink. Ching, 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 They dropped them, ka-ching, into the chest until they had finished. Well, Ed, I'm getting tired of you talking about money. Well, maybe God is tired of you not giving your money to him. You ever thought about that? And I love, whenever I talk about money, I love to see the misers, the tightwad, just some of you look like this. One day I'm gonna video all this and take a picture, and I'm gonna do at one of our creative church conferences a, a message on why pastors need to talk about money, because used to, I, would, I was shy to talk about it. Not anymore, because I don't wanna rob you from a blessing. And see, God doesn't need your money. The guy's like, oh, I really need your money, ma'am. Sir, yes, uh-huh. He owns it all. It's a test. And what I'm talking about 
is usually the thing that, that, that keeps people from going to that next level and living the blessed life. And I'm really talking to guys, and I get it, guys, I understand we're thinking about providing, that's great. Thinking about saving, the Bible says that, good. We're thinking about, man, I've gotta provide for my kids' college or whatever, rah, rah, rah. Within that though, right where you are, you start to do what the Bible says, to bring the first to God and those offerings and you will see God miraculously intervene in your finances. But see, the devil himself shows up two times in every single worship service. When I present the gospel, when I say, okay, here's how you become a Christian, the devil will dog you with doubt, with questions, put it off every time. Number two, whenever we talk about tithing or money, the devil shows up big time. Why? Heart issue. You have a heart for God, you can have a heart for his house. And quite frankly, that subject is why I did not want to come to Dallas-Fort Worth 30 years ago, well, 29 years ago, and start fellowship. I didn't. I did not want to come to Dallas, Fort Worth. I love it here. I'm not moving. I love it. I didn't want to come. You're like, why? Because of what I'm talking about. I've traveled the world, had the opportunity to speak and do all this stuff, write books and blah, blah, blah. I've never seen a place like Dallas where there are more faux followers of Christ. I've never seen it. There are more fake Christians who are on their way to hell, who think they're going to heaven in Dallas-Fort Worth than any geographical location I've ever seen, bar none. I mean, people all the time go, oh yeah, I'm a believer. Really, where do you go to church? Oh, sometimes there, sometimes there. Oh man, you you don't have a heart for the house. You don't have a heart for God, I'm thinking. Who's your pastor? Oh man, what is, uh, come on man. You think I'm an idiot? We have a staff member who grew up in another part of the country. And one of the first things he said, I was asking him, uh, so I go, hey man, as I ask him, what's the difference between Dallas, Fort Worth and and where you live in the Southeast? He goes, I've never seen as many hypocritical, Bible studying, fake Christians in one place in my life. He said, where I lived in the Southeast, he said, if you were a believer, you were in it. I mean, you were serving. You were, you, were, you were engaged, involved, but he said, here in Dallas, it's kind of popular, you know? That's why I didn't want to come up here. And that's why we don't reach a lot of people from other churches. I mean, with some, I understand that. But that's why Fellowship Church, we just say, okay, here's, here's what it is. We're not trying to appease some group or, or, or please this churchy church, you know, activity, whatever. We just want to be God's church. We want to be God's people and we want to reach people and we want to be a tabernacle of witness because one of the other things about Dallas Fort Worth that'll, that'll, that'll make you crazy is we have a lot of big churches, but they're not reaching anybody. Oh, they're moving a lot of eh, sheeple around. Oh, they move a lot of people, but they don't really reach anybody. That's why they want to come up here. Let me just kind of vent. But I'm glad we did, because Fellowship Church, we reach people. I mean, we flat out reach people. Norman, Oklahoma, man, we're reaching people. Miami, Florida, we're reaching people. Northport, Florida, we're reaching people. Downtown Dallas, we're reaching people. Fort Worth, we're reaching people. Keller South Lake, we're reaching people. Did they leave any other? Where? The prison campuses, man, we're reaching people. Frisco, yeah, Frisco. We're reaching people. So that's, that's, that's kind of what we do. That's what we're about. But if you have a heart for God, you'll have a heart for his house. And Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where, what, what? I can look at your financials and, and tell you if you love God or not. Oh yeah, but it's intangible. It's a faith thing. Okay. Try that with your wife. Oh, Lisa, I love you, baby. Mm. 
I'm a Hallmark stud. Mm. Show me. Show me. That's what God's saying. Okay, great. Man, you lift your hands and worship. You're a greeter, a parker, you're on staff at fellowship. Sit on the front row. Okay, show me. Oh, yeah, but this is my, this, God, this is mine. I mean, it's, I, I made it. I, I did it. I, I wrote these books. I started this church with some people. I, I preached a certain, what? What? Who gave me this body? Who gave me this voice? Who gave me the gifts? Who, who gave me this opportunity? I'm just using myself as an example. You're the same way. Man, so everybody was happy. They dropped the dime in Uncle Jay's chest. And then check this out. The last thing I'll read, verse 13, Second Chronicles 24. So the workmen labored. So they gave the money to the workmen and the repair work progressed in their hands according to its specifications and they strengthened it. That's what we're doing. We're strengthening the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We're strengthening the body of Christ. How are we strengthening that? How are we strengthening our church? By sharing, by serving, by sowing. Next weekend, we're going to have Uncle Jay's chest at all of our locations. And we're going to have opportunities for people to come forward and place three-year commitments over and above your regular giving to this adventure. Well, let me give you some more scripture about Uncle Jay's chest. Second Kings 12, 9, you can jot this down, but then Uncle Jay, Jehoiada, the priest, took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord and the priest who kept the door put the money ka-ching, brought into the house of the Lord. So it's like down front, man. It's pretty convicting, isn't it? What if I did that next week? I'm not, but what if I just stood there? You, okay, you, you. Some of you, see, think you're gonna be sly. You're gonna come forward next week and put a blank card in this. Well, let me, let me give you a warning. If you read Acts chapter five, and this is gonna be, this, this should scare the hell out of you because Ananias and Sapphira lied to God like that and God took them out on the spot. Now, I could do a message one day, and this is, this is really scary. I don't know if I'll ever do it, but I've had, wow, I can think about 10 intense conversations with people over the subject of finances and giving because I've talked to them about it and I just basically said, hey, you know, you're not gonna live the blessed life until you bring this to God and if you wanna roll the dice and if you think you're big enough and bad enough by yourself to do life, to do finances away from God, go for it. And I can think about those 10 situations and where those 10 people are today, and it's not pretty. Many of their lives are riddled with tragedy. So if you wanna roll that dice and come down here and put in a blank card or have some kind of corny little saying on it or something, be my guest, but just remember, you're under the judgment of God. If you wanna play in God's court, if you wanna play dodgeball with him, go for it. Now, if you're upset at this message, you're selfish. You're not a giver. So if you complain about this message, you're a walking, talking, billboard advertisement. You're a pop-up. I'm selfish, I'm a miser, and I think I own it. And that's okay. We always have people that say that. And for many of you, this will be your last Sunday at Fellowship. Great. We're going to need your seat very, very soon. So don't worry about it. We're all good. We're all good. But I love talking about this. And see, I couldn't talk about it if I didn't do it. I've been doing this, man, 
Well, obviously, for the 29 years of fellowship and ever since I've been a believer. Here's what I want you to do before we pray. You'll see a commitment card, and it's on your seat back. I want every single person to take a commitment card because everybody can make a commitment to this endeavor. You know, I'm gonna talk about a text in the next couple of weeks. It's one of my favorites. One day, Jesus was standing by the offering box in the temple, and this widow dropped in a couple of coins. ka ka-ching. And the disciples didn't even really see it. Jesus goes, whoa, guys, hey, hey, guys, that's the best, most generous gift anybody has put in the box all day. And the disciples were like, what? He said, no, 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 that was it. So, you know, there's some people here, you could do a seven-figure gift, no doubt about it, over three years, and it wouldn't even affect your lifestyle one bit. Others, maybe $1,000, $500 over three years, that's big for you. That might be the greatest gift. So it's not like, oh boy, this person gave seven figures, rah, 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 he's the man or she's the woman. Good, if you do that. So God doesn't look at how much you make, he looks at how much you give. And we're to give sacrificially. What did David say? I'm not gonna give God anything that doesn't cost me something. To sacrifice means you take something that matters to you, money, and put it, and you put it towards something you value even more, the house of God. And for me, if I don't, and this is why I challenge you to sign up for recurring giving, if I don't get it out of my hands quickly, it'll get around my heart, and I'll become even more materialistic than I am. Why does it get so quiet when I talk about money, death, and sex? You think only one of those is good. And that's not true. Money's good and death is good. If you're a believer, you're going to heaven. So what can you do over three years? Take this home and pray over it. And next week, you know what we're doing next week? We are premiering a movie here. We're making a movie at Fellowship Church and we're premiering it next week. You don't wanna miss it. That's a golf clap. Come on. That's what I thought. I'm gonna start doing that. That's gonna be my signal now because I need, thank you for that compliment. I need that. So if I'm like feeling low or like, wow, this is convicting you. When I do this. <laughs> wow, I feel, I feel better already. I'm like, man, maybe people did love the message on money. I, hey guys, I get the struggle. Don't think I don't. Don't think I don't get it, man. I feel you. I got it. I got it. It's a battle in my life. I'm a pastor. I get it. I mean, Lisa and I are going to give, for us, a huge gift. We're giving several hundred thousand dollars over and above our regular giving to this endeavor. Now, some of you are going, man, how much do you have? Just, just worry about how much you're giving, how much I'm giving. For us, that's a lot. A lot. If you look at my, if my net worth, you go, oh, man, Ed, you're 57 years old. That much money now? With the kids and the grandkids and blah, 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 you go, ah, oh, that's, that's not very smart. Well, that's, that's, that's in the world's eyes. But also, too, I know, I believe, I'm stretching out over the next three years. I've got some book deals. I've got some investments. I do some other stuff other than this. I think it's going to happen. Hopefully, I'll give more than that. For me, that's a lot. I know it's a lot. It's a lot of money for anybody. It's a lot. I just wanted to tell you, you know. Keeping it real. $10,000 could be massive. That's a lot of money over three years. But for some, I know who you are. No, I don't. Well, some of you, I do. Because you know there's this engine now, that, this app, you can do a net worth study. You can type in your address and your name, and it can tell you pretty close what your net worth is. How crazy is that? We have it. The guy in our church was like, here. It's not like it's secretive or, oh man, you're... No, no, it just, he just has it for all these people. He's like, here's what, so we have more than enough to make this happen, you know. 
But I don't think all of the net worth numbers this, this, this guy's shown me are correct. But even if they're in the ballpark, I mean, come on. I know if we all made below the poverty level and we brought 10%, we would take in double the amount that we do right now. Let me say that again. I didn't stutter. At Fellowship Church, if every single person took in below the poverty level or right at the line of the poverty level and we tithed, we would take in double what we do right now. How do you like that? And that's that way for every church in America. Will that keep you up at night? Some of the bean counters are trying to turn the numbers. It's okay, man. It's okay. Anyway, pray about this. Fill this out. And we're going to do a chest of Joe Ash, really Uncle Jay's chest. After we see this movie next week, it's going to be like a 13-minute movie. It's going to be awesome. We're going to walk forward and boom, put these commitments in.